Now then, we got a if vehicle owner reports that the brakes lock up during normal use, you should check the level of fluid in the reservoir and then look for leaks. Sure, that's right. Now, uh, let me ask you this. Will leaks or low fluid level cause the brakes to lock up? Nope. No, then, then that, does that sound to you like that answer should be true? Should be false. Or should it be false? So what be? should you do? And it's locked up the first thing. Well, you know, to start with, you want to know, you remember when that green pickup truck, the brakes were locking up? Mm -hmm. I measured the temperature of the wheels to oh, see which okay. one was getting hot. Mm -hmm. And then I went investigating that particular one. We had two calipers sticking on that one. And that's what you're going to do. If the brakes are locking up, you need to find out why they're locking up. Like, for instance, if you've got a caliper that's, that's locking up, mm -hmm. and, I, and I hope that phone don't ring. Look at that phone outside on the table out there so I don't. If you've got a caliper that's locking up, and let's say that you I like to raise the truck up off the ground. And I like to try to turn all the wheels. I'm going to try to turn the wheels. If the wheels don't turn, let's say, that, let's say all of the wheels turn except the left front one and it is just seized up solid. Mm -hmm. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break the bleeder loose. The bleeder? The, 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 where you go to bleed, where you bleed oh, the brakes. Okay, okay. So let the fluid pressure off. Okay. Either going to do that or I'm going to break the, the, if I can't break the bleeder loose, I'm going to break, break the, uh, the line loose where it goes into there. Mm -hmm. And if I break the line loose and all of a sudden the wheel turns easy, I know that fluid is trapped there. From a, coming from a proportioning valve or the master cylinder, right? Well, they're airing, you know. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter because right now you're you're yeah. looking. Even if it lets in, you're gonna bleed it out anyway. Yeah, yeah. So all you're, what you're doing is troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. uh, why is this thing locked up? If I loosen that line and I release the fluid pressure and it's still locked up, it's the caliper. End of story. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If the brakes yes. are locking up now, if the, all of the brakes are locking up, uh, like on George uh, Showalter's Dodge truck. He, his brakes were locking up, his master cylinder was leaking, the fluid was going back into the brake booster, and it was causing issues there. And uh, his brakes kept locking up. When we pulled the, the master cylinder off, got the brake booster off, we poured a quart of brake fluid out of the brake booster. Because it went past the seal on the master cylinder, got, you know, the master cylinder went bad, went back in there. Well, it can cause it to lock up. It can, but checking the fluid ain't going to tell you nothing. Right. I mean, that's okay, but you're not going to find a, a locking up brake by checking the fluid. Now, if he's continually been having to add fluid and you don't see it going anywhere oh, and his brakes are locking up, yeah, suspect the booster. See what I'm saying? But if he told me, he said, man, I've been adding a lot of fluid to this thing. Well, it had a leak nowhere. Right? I know. But anyway. Yeah. All right. So there we go. All right. All right. Now then. Um. This is what we got here. The next one is if, when a driver releases the brake pedal, a spring returns the piston in the brake assembly to its original position. Well, what are they talking about here? Are they talking about disc brakes? Or are they talking about drum brakes? When a driver releases the brake pedal, a spring returns the piston in the brake assembly to its original position. You got me talking about drum. Well, yeah, if they're, you know, and that one there, the, the answer key says true, but it's not a spring that causes it to return in the disc brake. And the disc brake has got a square O-ring around that big piston, and that square O-ring distorts whenever the piston is applied. When you let off, the, the O-ring returns to, it's got a memory like all rubber does, turns its original shape, and it pulls the piston back just a tiny bit. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the right answer if you're talking about drum brakes, right? Um, because there are springs on your drum brakes like we all know about. And there's also a spring inside the uh, wheel cylinder. Uh, as the piston in the brake assembly returns, the brake fluid flows from the high pressure chamber. As the piston in the brake assembly returns, the brake fluid flows from the high pressure chamber. Obviously, it's got to leave, doesn't it? Yeah. Got that? It's free. Uh, but, but, Think about it. If a, I mean, what's the high pressure chamber? What are they talking about here? What they're talking about is in the master cylinder. Let's make sure we get that answer the right one, so you don't get it marked wrong. Uh, the high pressure chamber in the master cylinder is going to get fluid. Fluid's going to go back into it, right? So it's going to not flow from it. It's going to flow back into it. Because if you if you're talking about the high pressure chamber, which is what this is actually the question is talking about in the uh, inside the master cylinder, you got a high pressure chamber that becomes high pressure when you mash your brake. Uh, That's front, false. Yeah, so that one is false. A front wheel drive vehicle has a dual braking system. If one system fails, the other may not be able to stop the vehicle alone. 
Isn't that why they set up no braking systems? So that if one system fails, the other will stop? Yeah, you got some braking, but uh, I'm going to tell you, there's, uh, in a lot of these situations, uh, if you ever had your, have you ever driven one where the brake was failed? Yeah, well, yeah, you knew it was going to, you know, yeah, like I, that. I knew I couldn't stop it. There was a guy one time I read about in a Motor Age magazine that was, everybody was sending in stories, and they said this guy uh, pulled, this guy was running a gas station at the time, and I used to work at a gas station back in the 70s. But anyway, he said this guy just pulled in onto the lift, and uh, he said, I've got a blown wheel cylinder on my Studebaker, it was an older car, you know. And he says, and I, but I've took care of this before, and I know what to do about it. And he said, well, okay, whatever. So he raised the car up for the guy. And the guy got up there, and the wheel cylinder, the old right rear was leaking. And so he got a hammer, and he just beat the line flat so no fluid could go through it. Dang. And then when he backed out of the uh, shop, uh, the car didn't stop, and it went off down in the ditch. <laughs> and so the guy at the filling station went up and said, hey, what happened? He goes, I don't understand. The first three times I did this, it worked just fine. This is a true story. It's not a joke, okay? <laughs> he had already beat all of his brake lines flat and thought he was still going to be able to stop, you know, as long as the pedal felt okay. That's if somebody didn't understand nothing about brake. Right? All right. Some people used to put a nail. They'd take it out and they put a little nail in there and tighten it up and make it, you know, where it wouldn't, no fluid could get out. Um, but anyway, and some of them will keep doing that until they only got one wheel stopping them. So, yeah, uh, it's supposed to do that, but it's basically just, that's basically a situation where you're, uh, it's just trying to keep you from losing your brakes altogether. Now, on the, uh, it actually has got mechanical brakes that take over in case your hydraulic brakes fail. I mean, they had linkage that would apply the brakes in case you, you know, if you hit the brake and you lost your hydraulic fluid, it would apply a mechanical brake. So brakes have always been something like that. But, yeah, the, the dual on some vehicles, uh, if the vehicle's heavily loaded and you've got a lot of momentum, uh, you'll be able to slow it down and eventually stop it, but you're not going to be able to do no kind of a panic stop. You're probably going to keep going if you've got half your wheels not stopping you. So that's the stop line by putting it down and lower yeah. slow it down. Anyway. Well, see, this is a guy that, that grew up like I did. He had to make stuff work whenever it wasn't quite right. And I'm going to tell you something else. Uh, brakes uh, can work good one time and fail the next time. And that's scary as all get out. Uh, Alan Cobb was driving his 93 Toyota Camry coming to work one day. And I don't mean, I don't even know where he'd been getting his brakes done. This was way back, you know, a long time ago. And he'd been getting his brakes done somewhere, but I don't know where. And uh, everybody, instead of measuring the thickness of the brake rotor, which is what you're supposed to do every time, they just kept machining them. And they got the, the, the rotors pretty thin to the point to where he kept wearing his brake pads out as he wore out. And the brake pads got to a certain point to where the piston pushed him in far enough that they just shot out of there because they were too thin to be held by the, you know, because the rotor was too thin. And uh, so he mashed the brake once. He's coming out of Enterprise. And he went to turn, and there was a truck coming, and he was going to stop. You know, he's in a turn lane, and there was a truck coming, big truck or whatever. And so he goes to mash the brake. And all of a sudden, the pedal goes all the way to the floor, and the car keeps going. And he's almost in the front of this big truck, so he had to steer off over to the side of the road and do things to get the car to stop. True story. I ain't making this up. And uh, so, uh, anyway, he called, his, he called his wife. You know, he said, I was trying to be as upbeat and everything. And I said, hi, hey, Cindy, how you doing? I had a little trouble with the camera. Ah, crap, you know. <laughs> but anyway, they had to put, you know, new rotors on it, all that kind of thing. Another thing was me and the guy that eventually became the mayor of Enterprise at one point, and this girl named Kathy Pouncey were riding around one Sunday afternoon on a old Volkswagen Bug that my dad bought. These two soldiers came walking out, and they had been piddling around trying to hot ride this Volkswagen Bug, and they just got tired of fooling with it, and they quit running on them uptown. And they asked my dad about it, and he says, and you'd have to have a title for a car in those days. Before 1975, you didn't have to have a title in Alabama. You could just go, mm -hmm. you know, you had a tag or see or say when. It, mm -hmm. So, so if it had been setting up, you could just ask him to give you a title. He'd say, what's serial number? You know, I mean, not a title, but a tag. So anyway, he says, uh, these guys come walking through and say, well, the car quit on us, we're tired of fooling with it, and you know, what do you think it might be? He says, I don't know. He says, I'll tell you what, we'll say the car side unseen, 50 bucks. Mm. And for some reason, he could tell they were on the up and up, so he gave him 50 bucks, and he went up there, and I think the call wire had come loose or something, he put it back on, boom, and drove it out of the shop. And I said, hey, this is cool, it's got a little two-barrel carburetor on it, and they had somebody had painted flowers on it, because that was back in the hippie days, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And all that stuff. And so, uh, I said, I'm going to drive this thing around. You, know, you get a new car, you don't care if it's a crappy car or whatever. Yeah, so when you just got you, you want to drive it around. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm cruising around on that thing. My dad had insurance 
that covered me, it was like garage owner's insurance. Anybody that was working at the shop was covered on his car insurance, and that's the way he covered me on insurance. It didn't cost him very much, about 50 bucks a month or something. So I says, uh, okay, I'm going to be driving this thing, and Johnny was with me, and Kathy was sitting on We were gentlemen, see. She was sitting on a board in the back seat where the back seat was supposed to be. <laughs> and we were sitting in the front. And so we were on College Street, and I'm coming along. I've been driving, stopping, driving, stopping all day. And so we were coming, there was a, a road, two roads coming down, or what's road going down across another road. And I so I, I and Johnny says, there's a stop sign up here, so I hit the brake. And um, it didn't stop. I mean, it didn't even slow down, and the pedal was like, Toof, all the way to the floor. And uh, there was a pickup truck and another car coming, and they were about 20 feet apart. And man, all I could see was that pickup. We were about to plow into that pickup. And then the pickup was gone. We went between those two cars. Oh, I mean, you couldn't have timed it that way if you were making a movie. Unless you had the cars on being pulled by cables and pulleys. Oh, man, that scared us too out of us. We, and it, but it had a little bit of brake fluid leak right there at the master cylinder. And it had le leaked it all out with no warning. There was no brakes. You know? And I just, I, woof, all right, it's pretty spooky to even think about that. <laughs> but I guarantee you, if you could find... Johnny Henderson right now and say, do you remember when y'all went through between those two cars on college? He would remember that. And that was 30 years ago. People, I guarantee you remember that. So would Kathy. Kathy was sitting in the back seat. Okay. Uh, now they are sitting on a board before the back seat was supposed to be. You know, we were just, you know, whatever. And, uh, I have lots of funny, I have lots of funny stories I can tell, by the way, but I'm going to move on. Okay, so, uh, and you'll hear the other funny stories later on. Okay, the uh, history. Huh? Number four is actually going to be true. Uh, disc brakes respond more quickly. In other words, number four would be if uh, a front-wheel drive vehicle has dual braking system. If one system fails, the other may not be able to stop the vehicle alone. Disc brakes respond more quickly than drum brakes. True or false? True. That is true. A proportioning valve is a valve that delays fluid flow to the front brakes. A metering valve reduces the amount of braking force at the rear wheels to prevent rear wheel lockup. That's backwards, guys. Okay. A proportioning valve is the one that goes that's in the in these lines down usually a lot like on I've told Tyler to find me the proportioning valves on the Oldsmobile. They're in the lines back in the back. You know. And it's basically where does the weight go when you stop? No, it goes to the front. The, you know, most of the brakes stop it gonna be in the front. What happens if I'm if I'm driving around a, a wet or icy curve Oh, in traffic and other cars are meeting me and all of a sudden this guy in front of me stops and i got to stop. If my rear wheels lock up, I'm already in a curve. You know? So you don't want the rear wheels locking up. You see, I mean, what you're wanting is the front wheels to do most of the stopping and after you've already started stopping, then the back wheels kick in and they finish the job. All right, now on a trailer, what do you want to happen? You ever fool with trailer brakes? Trailer? Yeah. Like any trailer you're pulling behind your, I'm not talking about a house trailer. I'm talking about any kind of any kind of trailer you're pulling behind your. Uh, you want the trailer. You want the trailer to stop first, basically. And they have brakes on the thing. Oh, absolutely, they do. They got brakes. I need to throw brakes on them. Huh? I need to throw the brakes. Well, it depends on the U-Haul trailers. Believe it or not, this is cool. I don't know who came up with this, but they're smart. A big spring and a master cylinder. Yeah. And it's it's got a sliding tongue. And whenever you uh, hit the brake, it squeezes that spring, and that master cylinder applies hydraulic brake pressure to the rear wheel. You ain't got to do nothing. That's pretty good. Cool. That's right. So it, it, it knows the only the problem is if you're backing that sucker uphill, it ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Okay? Oh. So that's the deal on that. You see where I'm going with that? All right. So, and I've been there. I've been there. Believe me, I had a trailer like that. that I, when I moved back from Texas, I was trying to back it up a hill, and it wouldn't go, and it's a truck tire standing. Oh, what's wrong with this? You know? You got to get a trailer in there. See yeah, but uh, it's a cool little thing. It's got a little master, little uh, cast iron master cylinder on it with a cap on it and all that. Now I don't know if the new U haul trailers are like that, but they made them like that for years. Now, so what else they do? Some of them will have electric trailer brakes, and you know the the lever on your park brake. I think there's several different ways of doing it, but the lever that's on your park brake, mm -hmm. basically that pulls and spreads the shoes. You know what I'm saying? That one that comes around that's hooked with the horseshoe. Uh, that is actually got a big magnet on it, and what that magnet does is. When you energize, well, it's electromagnet. When you energize the electromagnet, uh, it, the electromagnet goes against the drum and it actually applies the brakes that way. So there's there's a bunch of different ways you can do trailer brakes, but the trailer brakes have got to be adjusted. On uh, they got a trailer brake controller that you put on there, and it actually the the amount of whenever you start to apply your brakes, uh, it starts pulsing the trailer because you don't want the trailer brakes to lock up either. See, 
But if you don't have trailer brake, you know what happens then? If you've got a heavy trailer you're pushing, it's going to jackknife the doggone truck. I've actually known I'm pushing the truck, and you know, the truck's sliding the wheels and the trailer's pushing it and it turns the trailer over. So that's not a good thing there. Okay. Um, all right. Now then, um, what we got? Next one. What you got? <coughs> During master cylinder bed bleeding, bleed lines are run uphill to a clean catch container. Yeah, during master cylinder bench bleeding, they got to go uphill to a clean catch container. Usually that's where, back in the reservoir, right? right. So you're going to bench bleed it so you don't have to, when you put the new master cylinder in, you got to bleed every, everything. When forcing the air out of the master cylinder during a bench bleed, the pistons can be moved using a wooden dowel. Well, we use yeah. Huh? We Actually, number seven, I'm sorry, I don't let me mess you up on number seven. Uh, you don't, you run the lines in back into the, and I said that, but I didn't give you the right answer. Uh, they, you don't run them to a clean catch container. You actually run them back into the master cylinder reservoir because you're cycling the fluid through when you're ble master cylinder bench bleeding. Uh, but you can use the dowel. Yes, you can. That's true. During a master cylinder bench bleed, the primary and secondary pistons need to be pushed only once to drive all the air from the cylinder. That's wrong. you got to do better than that. You know, and you're going to put your master cylinder in. You can actually bench bleed the master cylinder by putting it on the truck hooking your lines up and having somebody mash the brake pedal and do it if you want to do it that way and then hook your regular lines up. Some people prefer that. Uh, many vehicles with front, if, well, let me ask you that. Let me tell you this. If you don't bench bleed it, you're going to be bleeding the whole brake system. So you say whenever you put it, if you do it the way that you put it on the car, you just put the lines back on? No. You don't no. put the lines back on it yet because oh, you're going to okay. pump air into them if you do. You okay. actually put the lines that you would put oh, back just in. Like you was bench yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And you just go ahead and it, yeah. with it on the car, oh, okay. you're using it with your foot. And I kind of like that better personally because mm -hmm. you can pump the thing and get all the air out of it and instantly you can yeah. pop those off and screw yeah. your line in. Yeah. And you're less likely. If you do it right, you don't have to bleed nothing else. But if you do it wrong, you're you up with the wheels, you're bleeding the holes from here. It's just not, you know. Uh, number 10. Many vehicles with front and rear drum brakes have a four function combination valve. Wrong. Well, that's not right. The output piston in a hydraulic system exerts five times the force that the applied piston exerts. Why is the output force greater? A, the output piston moves five times as far. B, the area of the output piston is five times as large as the area of the applied piston. C, the area of the output piston is one-fifth as large. Or D, the pressure of the remote cylinder is five times as great as the pressure in the master's arm. Remember Pascal's law that we were talking about? If I've got a if I've got a little piston here and it's pushing on a, you know, you got a line going over here, and I got a big piston here that I'm pushing on. When I apply this right here, this is five times as big as that. There's going to be five times as much force here, but there's going to be five times less movement. You're going to move this five times as far as you do that, but you're actually going to have a lot more power being applied. So a little bit of pressure here will put up a lot of pressure there. And the way they got this brake pedal fixed on these cars nowadays, you know, and they always have, you got a lot of leverage to start with. You got a little bitty piston here, you got a bigger piston back there, and you're going to wind up doing a heck of a lot of work. Like, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds is not uncommon on brake lines. That's a lot of pressure. That's why it's really important to make sure when you're looking at the brake lines, you don't see any external rust on them. Because if anything makes those brake lines get a little bit thinner, they will go and start spraying fluid everywhere. And I've seen that. You can look at, and you know, you ever notice how on old pickup trucks the dirt gathers on the frame? Yeah. Because somebody likes to take it off road. Yeah, exactly. And so what happens is, in some cases, the way the brake lines are routed, they are buried in that dirt. And the dirt gets... Oil and yeah, dirt but, and well, the oil ain't a problem for the brake lines. Yeah. As long as it's covering the outside of them. But the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the brake lines are coated with something to combat rust, but they don't, it doesn't work perfectly. And so what happens is you got all this dirt and everything that gets moist all the time, and those brake lines are... Uh, the dirt gets wet that's around the brake lines, and they stay wet all the time, eventually they start to rust, and then you bust a brake line. I mean, and it'll spray fluid all over the place when you do. And the right way to fix a brake line, and i got a worksheet on that, is what? What you going to do? Replace the brake line? Well, you yes and no. But what you can do is you're going to actually, you start out, your tool is going to do this to start with, right? Okay. And then the next step, it's going to take that and it's going to fold that in. And this is a sort of a cutaway view of it. 
In other words, if you did this right here and dotted that line, that's what it would be looking like. In other words, you actually are going to push that down in there so this is folded back. It's a, that's what I call a double flare. And I do have a worksheet that I give out where you double flare for brake lines. So you're going to cut the brake line again. You're going to cut the brake line and you can actually build a brake line and you're going to shape it the same way and route it the same way. One of the ones on our little range right here, he routed right. You know, so it's basically, no, it's not yeah, it's supposed to go right along there and go up and then go in. Like somebody just ran it straight over there because it was trying to do. And people can do that. If it don't ever chafe on anything, it's probably going to be okay. But you don't want to put the brake lines either where that's going to hook them yeah. and jerk them loose and all that either. So, But anyway, basically on this one here, on number 11, number 11 is B. To multiply the output force of a hydraulic system, what do you do? Use an output piston with a larger head. You're going to put a larger output piston in an integral master cylinder. Brake fluid is contained in one reservoir. Some parts are plastic and some are aluminum, or reservoirs are in the same master cylinder assembly, or the reservoirs are attached to the master cylinder. Reservoirs are attached to the master cylinder. No, actually, they're part of it. You know the old cast iron ones? Uh, one time I had an old 70 model Ford pickup I owned for a little while. And uh, that darn thing, the master cylinder was a part of the, the cast iron master cylinder, because most of them nowadays are aluminum. You know the plastic ones that pop into the grommets? That's not integral. Integral means it's part of the master cylinder. And I bought a master cylinder. Think about this now. You know the core charge is what they charge you for the old part if you want to keep it. Yeah. When you first go to buy your master cylinder, they say you're, and this master cylinder was $14. But the core charge was 18 So that would you $4? Well, think of, yeah, no, what happens is they're going to charge you 14 plus 18 when you, unless you've got one in your hand. So it's like yeah, technically they... 32. They, yeah. With a core charge, it's 14. Yeah. After you give them your master cylinder back, you get your $18 back. They're charging you more if, if you keep yours than they were if you... Wow. Buy, you know, when you, you buy it, they're going to charge you 14 plus 18. Usually the core charge will be $5 and the part yeah. will cost, you know, not very much. You see, that's why that goes. But, but um, anyway, that's just kind of interesting, I thought. So um, but they wanted them back so bad. How many 70 model Ford pickups are there running around out there? So the reservoir are in, it, Integral reservoirs made onto the master so cylinder. So the reservoir are in the master cylinder assembly? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's going to be uh, number 13 is going to be the right answer. 13 is C. Okay. A composite master cylinder... A is used on some large cars and light trucks. B has a plastic reservoir attached by rubber grommets. C has plastic and cast iron parts. Or D has two pistons that move in the same bore. That's actually B. It's got a plastic reservoir attached by rubber grommets is what the deal is on that. But, um, all right. Now then, the replenishing port. What? A is located toward the front of the reservoir. B allows fluid to enter the high pressure chamber. C allows fluid to enter the low pressure chamber. Or D prevents a partial vacuum from developing ahead of the piston. That's actually going to be C. It allows fluid to enter the low pressure chamber. Okay? The replenishing port. Which is not true of vehicles with disc brakes and a quick take up master cylinder. All right? The calipers have a special seal that quickly pulls the piston back into the bore. That's true. The caliper piston must move a longer distance because the pads are farther from the rotor. What do you think about that one? Well, actually, that's true. The secondary piston moves in a step bore cylinder, which is not true. The brake pedal need not move over a long distance. You know, we've talked about this before a little bit since we've been doing this brake bleeding stuff and all that, but there's times whenever the uh, brakes will feel really, really good when you hadn't started the engine, and when you start the engine, they go almost all the way to the floor. <laughs> then you find you still got air in there. That, that is, that's always really aggravating, and it'll blindside you if you're not careful. Um, you also know that whenever you push your pistons back up in there after you put pads on there, you better pump those brakes to make sure that everything moves back, pistons move out, because... Sometimes people will just say, hey, I've got new brakes on here. Woo, and they fire it up, and they back out. And the first time they hit the brake, they ain't got it, and they got to hit it again. You know? That's pretty scary whenever there's a bunch of stuff down there in, in, in the way. Um, let's see. What is the purpose? Now, 16, you got to remember, is C. 
that was, you know, secondary piston does not move in a step force shoulder. The purpose of bleeding a hydraulic brake system is to do what? Uh, well, let's do this. A, to replace old brake fluid. B, to remove dust particles and moisture from the brake fluid. C, to force trapped air out of the brake fluid. Or D, all of the above. All the above. Why is brake fluid pushed out during manual bleeding? A, opening the bleeder valve creates a vacuum. Is that true? No. B, the bleeder hose acts like a siphon. Is that true? No. All right. C, depressing the service brake pedal raises hydraulic pressure. Good move. That's the one. And finally, D, adding fluid to the master to the reservoirs increases pressure in the master cylinder brake lines and wheel cylinder. Uh, that's not true. 18 would be depressing. You know, you're going to make pressure and air is going to push it out. That ain't really a hard question. The purpose of the of OSHA is to assure as far as possible safe and helpful working conditions and to A, underwrite riders and workers' compensation programs, B, provide material data safety sheets, C, research and produce ergonomically designed tools, or D, preserve human resources. 19 is D, preserve human resources. What they're trying to do is keep people from getting hurt on the job. That's basically now, which one of the following steps is done first during master cylinder bench bleeding? This is number 20. The master cylinder reservoir is filled with clean brake fluid. The master cylinder is mounted in a vise. The bleed lines are removed. The primary and secondary pistons are removed. There you go. Put it in a vise. There you go. Uh, which of the following? Now, how do you put it in a vise? Now, ooh, back up. You're not going to put it in the vise where you're squeezing the round sides of the master cylinder because you may egg shape it. You're going to put it in a vise so you're pinching one of the ears. You know where the bolts go through? You're going to pinch one of the ears, okay? Which of the following steps is done last during master cylinder bench bleeding? Uh, 21. The master cylinder reservoir is filled with clean brake fluid. Air is forced out of the master cylinder by moving the pistons. The bleed lines are removed. The bleed lines are attached to outlet ports. The bleed lines are removed. The bleed lines are removed. There you go. And, and that concludes the review of that particular test.